Episode 4, Conquest, opens with narration over an animated sequence. The realm known as Adenia was at peace. Alright, seriously Netherrealm, you need to pick an official pronunciation for this realm's name or people are going to keep getting it wrong. Is it Edenia, Edenia or Edenia? Pick one! For years, Edenians enjoyed life without conflict. Bollocks! Conflict arises from difference of opinion and ideology. Are you honestly trying to tell me that they went thousands of years without any kind of conflict? See, I am sick to death of these made-up civilizations being so pure and unreasonably innocent, like the Na'vi from Avatar. But Adenia's best warriors lost ten consecutive mortal combat tournaments, granting Outworld permission to invade their lands. The tournament was only established after the conquest of Edenia. And Adenia was destroyed. No, it was merged with Outworld. So that's one, two, three, four things already that have pissed me off. We see Baraka slaughtering people and he fortunately isn't a black dude with dreadlocks anymore. Instead, he's an Orc of Mordor. It's an improvement, but it's still completely wrong. Once resistance was extinguished, the Outworld Emperor, Shah Khan. That's Khan? Seriously? When Brian Thompson in Annihilation looks more right for the role, you're doing something wrong. I need to get a move on or I'll never get this done. So Khan is after King Jared, played by one-time Goku voice actor, Kirby Morrow. We approach quickly, King Jared. We must move. I cannot leave my wife and child. It will be protected. <laughs> Queen Sindel and Sindel Sindel Tankeron, you seem to be a fan of the game, so you should know how to pronounce Sindel. Was it really too much trouble to ask the woman to redo it? I mean, all you had to do was say, "Hey, um, it's pronounced Sindel, so could you please redo it?" I'm sure she wouldn't mind. Jared saves Sindel, but is caught by Baraka and killed. This man is an imposter. Your king has already escaped. Once he was in complete control, Shah Khan took Queen Sindel as his wife and... Queen Sindel... What? Queen Sindel... What? Queen Sindel... Queen Sindel... Are you fucking serious? Khan falls in love with Sindel... <laughs> But Sindel hates him. He orders Melina's creation, and what the fuck is that? When MK Conquest in 1999 looked better than this, you're doing something wrong. And now comes Sindel's suicide. Now, instead of sacrificing herself to protect Earthrealm like she does in the games, she does so to merge her soul with Kitana's to prevent Khan from corrupting her. Um, here's an idea. Why don't you stay alive and raise her yourself? With you gone, Khan will obviously raise her himself and surely that will do more damage than if you're there to guide her along the right path. Shah Khan exploited the exceptional skills possessed by both young girls and manipulated maturing emotions to ensure their allegiances remained only to him. Favouring Kitana will keep Melina loyal? How? Don't be so stupid. And Melina's mouth here is more like Conquest than the baby's mouth from before. Fortunately. Melina goes sick and kills a guy with stock Sony Vegas blood effects. In the animated segments. Laziness! They start a match and the episode ends. I'll save my overall thoughts on this episode until we've finished both parts, but... I can tell you this, it's not good. The story naturally continues in episode 5, Bloodlines. The episode opens with the two girls fighting before Khan, but the cinematography is awful here. The camera is often too close or at an odd angle and it gets hard to keep up with it. The choreography is decent, don't get me wrong, but the whole thing is just let down by poor framing and the fact that, of the two, 
it's Melina who's got the most to gain and given how her story's been shown so far, you kind of want her to win. And she's the villain. Enough. Very good, Katana. Katana emerges victorious and the stupid mouth effect returns. The two are sent to kill Jared's remaining imposters in, yes, another animated sequence. And it's only in these sequences that the girls get to use their signature weapons. Is this to tone down the gore by making it animated? They're sent after one last imposter and Kitana faces him. He recognises her despite the fact that he hasn't seen her since she was a featureless baby nearly two decades ago. The old man is about to tell Kitana the truth before being stabbed in the back by Melina. For the record, we don't actually see the weapons make contact, nor do we see any blood on them when she pulls them out. Tank around for fuck's sake, make up your mind. Do you want it gory or bloodless? And while you're at it, make up your mind if you want it animated or live action. The constant changing is annoying. You are... <laughs> my daughter. Shocked that her entire life may be a lie, Kitana sought to find the truth. So the dying words of some old guy are enough to convince her that her entire life is a lie? How easily led is she? So Princess Sheep, yes I'm calling her that from now on, goes back to her old home, in animation of course, and has flashes of her mother's memories. She returns to Khan as he discusses his plans for Earthrealm. I'm just going to say it. This was a terrible pair of episodes. The first one had a goofy ending, but at least it all made sense. Kinda. But, there are so many inaccuracies, bizarre story developments, annoying switching between live action and animation, not enough reasons to get invested in any of the characters, and way too much pussyfooting around the issue of how gory it should be. Don't get me wrong, the animated stuff is really good, and the style reminds me of the cutscenes from Infamous, but, I feel like the animated stuff should have been relegated just to the backstory and have all the actual main plot be told in live action. But there was some real potential with Melina as overall, she's the one being portrayed as more sympathetic, you know, being neglected by her father in favour of her sister and coming to terms with exactly what she is. I feel that expanding on these themes in a full episode would be a great idea but the focus of the two episodes is on Ideni and Sindel, then Kitana. Melina doesn't really factor in all that much, and it really was a waste. I'd say these should have gone at the start of the series, given what they're about, but if this had been the way the series opened, I don't think anyone would have stuck around afterwards. Fortunately, the next episode is a step up from the previous two, and begins with a foreword by Tankaron saying that he feels this one contains a perfect amount of realism and mysticism. We'll see. Episode 6, God of Thunder, opens with a man in a mental institute being interviewed by a doctor. It then cuts to three months earlier when said man fell from the sky with lightning flowing through him and crashed into the institute's grounds. Now where have I seen that before? Oh, no, this is Earth, isn't it? Now, I'm not saying that they necessarily copied Thor, but what I am saying is that they completely ripped off Thor. But let's just leave the blatant ripping off and carry on, shall we? He's found by a nice patient called Blue, seriously, before the dickhead doctors show up and sedate Raiden and take him inside. They don't know who he is, so he's clearly not a patient, so this is kidnapping. Yeah. And a man shows up in a crater on the grounds and has blue blood, but they never think there's something up with him. Hell, they don't even acknowledge that he has blue blood. How the hell did no one notice when a blue liquid came out of a man's body? I was tempted to call this episode Blue Blood and Thunder, but if you've not read the comics from the mid-90s, you'll have no bloody idea what I'm on about. No, blue bloody idea. <laughs> It seems that Raiden's power has been taken away like Thor's because he's there for three months and doesn't use them to escape. Be good and useless. If you don't let me go. Yes, you've explained this to me before. The Earth will be overtaken by Shao Kahn. 
Yes. And if you don't let me attend the Mortal Kombat tournament, I promise you, all of you will die. That's one way to get your premise across. A stupid way, but a way nonetheless. Raiden is given a lobotomy, but that doesn't stop him from doing his best Batman voice. Time is running out. We have to move now. He beats up a guard to get himself tasered so he can regain some of his powers, which is actually quite a smart move. But he's shot with a tranquilizer and given another lobotomy. This time more graphic with a piece of eye coming off. Gross. Blue, who is never even named such in the episode, enters the room and has a nice little scene with Raiden showing off some of the better writing of the series before following Raiden's plan by stabbing him in the heart. He disappears and she's coated in his blue blood, again, obviously trying to cut down on the gore. But what happens to Blue now? Raiden should have gone back, fully powered up and freed her, or something like that. Would have been a great way to show off what he's capable of. Instead, Raiden just finds himself in Asia, or a Chinatown somewhere, and nicks some poor bloke's hat. Cheeky bastard. Now, while this episode didn't have as much action as the first two, or as much story development as the third, it's still a very enjoyable episode and stood out in my mind as one of the better ones. I wouldn't say Tankeron was completely right about this being the perfect blend of realism and mysticism, but it was pretty good. It probably would have benefited from being longer and showing Raiden piecing together his ultimate escape plan, but what we got was good and the actual premise was interesting, if a little better suited for the other God of Thunder. But next up is the episode that everyone's been waiting for, the one everyone wanted to see from the second this series was announced. Next up is Scorpion and Sub-Zero.